warning. Morning. Happy Easter. Easter. Awfully tired this morning. Okay, that's fair. What's the biggest challenge that you have ever faced? Was it graduating high school? Graduating college? Finishing your master's degree? Maybe you were in the military and went to boot camp. <laughs> now that is a challenge. Maybe you're an athlete. Uh, perhaps you are a state level or even a collegiate state level athlete. These are challenges. Maybe uh, it was not so much school, but it has been work. Maybe you've launched your own business. Or maybe uh, you've promoted quickly through the levels and found yourself too young and not enough experience to be a boss, and yet here you are. Now, all of these things are great challenges. The fact is that we all chase, we all face challenges in life, and sometimes they seem insurmountable. Often we react to these insurmountable challenges with fear, sometimes so much so that we are initially paralyzed. Of course, if we continue to allow this fear to paralyze us, then we would never rise to these challenges and achieve those things which we are capable of. And so we must meet our challenges with perseverance and determination. And in our scripture for this morning, we're going to see a challenge. We're going to see the main character's response to that challenge. And then we're going to see the gospel writer Mark give an implicit challenge to Christians of all ages. And so we're going to ask, what is the challenge for Christians presented by the gospel of Mark? Now, for context, following Jesus' triumphal entry, which we talked about last week on Palm Sunday, Jesus had a week full of events, and I hope you read about those this week in Mark 14 and 15, which was your homework. These events led up to and include the Last Supper, Jesus' final hours in the Garden of Gethsemane, his arrest, trial, crucifixion, and burial. And so today it is here that we enter the story following the Sabbath after the burial, as several women who witnessed both the crucifixion and burial, return to the tomb. So let us turn there now in Mark chapter 16. I'll start in verse 1. Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought aromatic spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. They had been asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. When, as they went into the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting uh, on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Go. There is, look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Then they went out and ran from the tomb, for terror and bewilderment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, because... They were afraid. So the first thing that I want to point out here this morning is that these three women are identified by name. They're identifiable eyewitnesses. Really, all three of these women are mostly uh, unheard of throughout the gospel stories. Uh, Mary Magdalene is not well known. Luke 8 probably tells us the most until you continue after this in Mark. Uh, which says that she was one of the women, this is Luke 8 tells us, Mary Magdalene was one of the women who was traveling with Jesus and his disciples. Uh, these women were providing for them out of their own means. Uh, further, Luke tells us that seven demons had been driven out of this Mary, likely by Jesus. Nothing else is actually mentioned about her from that time at Luke 8 until uh, the crucifixion, where she is a recorded witness 
I think in all the Gospels but one. Don't quote me on that, though. And here we see that she was one of the women going to anoint Jesus, and yet found the empty tomb. She also appears, according to the Gospel of John, to be the first person to whom Jesus uh, revealed himself to after his resurrection. So we know who this Mary Magdalene was. She's an identifiable woman. This is a, a person who existed historically. Now Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, or Joseph, depending on which translation you're reading, this is the same person, the same son, I mean, uh, is Jesus' mother. Salome appears to be Mary's mother, Mary's sister, excuse me, who is the wife of Zebedee, which is the father of James and John. So likely this other Mary, uh, who is given no more identification than that, is the, uh, the mother of James and John, the sons of thunder. And so we see all three of these women, they're given identity. We see these are historical women who existed. And that's, I think, the first thing we need to draw out here from Mark. These are identifiable witnesses. He makes a point to name these women. As you're reading through, if you look at the end of uh, chapter 15, Mark has just named them as those who saw where the tomb was, and you back up a little more, these are the same women who just saw the crucifixion. The purpose is identification. Right? For his early readers, they could have gone and asked these women, or asked about these women, assuming that the audience that Mark wrote to was uh, probably in Rome, probably Greek. Uh, the identification matters for that historical reference point. We can pinpoint these three women. Here's who they were. They are the witnesses to whom we are referring this morning. It helps us to know that this really happened. The story wasn't made up. So among the things that these women have in common, you're going to be shocked by this, if they were women. <laughs> Get my signs out here if you people wake up. <laughs> Yet, they were the first eyewitnesses at the empty tomb. Now, this is unusual because in their culture, their role as witnesses wouldn't have been accepted. In a court of law, they couldn't be witnesses at all. Right? Women were not allowed to give testimony. This is one sign that supports the authenticity of the account because if someone were to make this up, Guess what they wouldn't do? I'm going to find three or four witnesses that can't count as witnesses legally because they're women, uh, and I'm going to base the whole thing on them. No, they would never do that. And so we see that these three women were witnesses to the crucifixion. At least both Marys saw where the tomb was, and now these three go to the empty tomb. If you look at a different record, I'm blanking on which gospel it is, records four women. Uh, this is one of the many things that people try to point at. Oh, there's inconsistencies. Well, just because you only named three doesn't mean a fourth wasn't with them, right? It's just that Mark either wasn't aware of her name, maybe wasn't aware of her existence, whatever. That's not a contradiction. Uh, there's no reason that those things need to be mutually exclusive. And so we see these three women, and here they go as they're on their way to the tomb. And now we know that at least two of them saw where the tomb was. So we can't then say, well, they just went to the wrong tomb. Now, that probably sounds silly to most of us, but it is indeed a theory that has been oppressed, passed around, uh, at least amongst Jews, for 2,000 years. It was not the wrong tomb. It was the right tomb. These women knew where it was. They know what they saw. It's a true story. Uh, based on their credible eyewitness. Well, just as an aside, I think that it might be noteworthy that the empty tomb is also an historical fact, a fact which one must reckon with. And however you want to deal with that, I guess that's between you and God. Uh, but the fact is that the tomb was empty. It was the right tomb, and it was found empty. They put Jesus there for his body. 
and then his body was gone. And so the fact is that there are several eyewitnesses to this. These three women, plus at least two of the twelve, uh, as recorded in, I think it's John. And so what do we do with this? Jesus is in the tomb Friday night. Come Sunday morning, he's gone. Furthermore, we have at least 500 people, says Paul, who saw Jesus after the resurrection. So now we have two problems. We have an empty tomb, and we have a dead person walking around everybody. <laughs> what do we do with that? And I've said this lots of times, the Christian faith really comes down to, do you believe the eyewitnesses or not? I find it so interesting, there's so many things in history that we just accept based on one, maybe two wit witnesses, written text, you know, uh, and we don't have any, any qualms or hesitation to believe, oh, that's what really happened. You know, Egypt was Egypt, and they did this whole thing, and they, you know, controlled part of the, most of the known world for a while. But the record of that is sparse and scarce. When we come to the record of Jesus Christ, his ministry, death, and resurrection, we have more, more older references, witnesses, than we do for basically any other historical fact. And so we end up at this place. This is a historical fact. Now, what you want to do with it, I guess that's your business. But these are historical facts that are well documented and supported, not only uh, by literature that has been passed through the ages, but also by eyewitness accounts. And so again, really, Christianity comes down to, do you believe the witnesses or not? Now, turning back to these women, another thing we see is that they loved Jesus. One more play. In addition to the clear devotion demonstrated by the physical proximity to Jesus in the final day of his life and his death and burial, we see them up at sunrise to anoint his body. Okay, this was no small thing. Jewish custom uh, was not to embalm, uh, but rather they would take uh, oils, aloe-type uh, oils, and anoint the body, and they would cover it in spices, such as myrrh and so on, uh, to cover up the stench of decay. But, I mean, think about that uh, smell after a body sits in the desert, in the dry arid, it's just gross. The body's going to decay and break down. Um, we have recorded in one of the Gospels that at least uh, Joseph wrapped the body and put some spices on it. Further, we see these women, they've determined they're going to do this. We're going to go respect Jesus' body. Whether they knew that some of the uh, anointing had already been done or not, I think is besides the point. The point is, these women are embarking on what is going to be an unpleasant task, and yet a sign of respect, and yet a mark of their love for Jesus, uh, a task that will mark and show their respect and devotion to this man. The point is, they were determined to demonstrate their love and respect for Jesus. And I think this explains the question. We, they were asking, who is going to roll away the stone for us? These stones were huge. Clay, can I have the next one? That is what the front of the tomb might have looked like. One more. See the stone on your right? Or your left. You can just see kind of it, part of it. So the door wouldn't be there. It'd be just a big black hole. And you can see that stone is kind of round. That's the rolled back position. One more. So that's from the side. You see how big that thing is. So that door is about four feet tall. I crawled my little self in there and I pushed on that rock as hard as I could and it did not wiggle. So these three little women and I don't mean any disparagement in that at all, these three women, who I'm sure were quite hefty for 
you know, stout ladies <laughs> used to working hard and doing the things, they ain't going to move that stone. And so they're asking each other, well, who's going to throw away this stone? Who's going to move it? Who's going to do whatever? This was a big stone. This was a big problem. And yet they determined, well, we're just going to go and we're going to figure it out because we are that dedicated to completing this task, this mark of devotion, this sign of love and respect. And I wonder, when have you determined that you would show Jesus your love, your devotion, your respect for him by accomplishing a task that seems undoable? See, the women knew that it would be unpleasant to go and anoint this body at this point after it had been starting the process of decay. They knew they had to figure out how they were going to move this stone, uh, yet they were determined to do so. They were going to demonstrate their love to Jesus by persevering and accomplishing this task. And so I wonder when is the last time you decided that you were going to accomplish a task that Jesus had given you? Did you determine to love your neighbor by raking their leaves, mowing their lawn, helping them with that odd job? Or building a relationship with that less than pleasant coworker? Not because they're mean, just because they talk too darn much, because they don't have anybody to listen to them at home? I wonder if, if you've taken the opportunity to share the gospel with a friend or relative or neighbor because they need to know Jesus too. All of these tasks can be quite daunting. We have you determined to show your love to Jesus through them. Back to the women. They received a message and a task. They received a message and a task. And so the women get within view of the tomb and lo and behold, this stone has been rolled away. Now there's probably some low-hanging fruit here about how God will remove the obstacles and he'll make a way forward for you to accomplish what his purpose is for you and all that's great and all that'll preach and that's not this sermon. It's not the point of Mark's story. See, what Mark is doing here is building up to this angel. The point is that these women are about to enter the tomb that is now empty and be greeted to receive a crucial message. So when they go into the tomb, they find this young man. Now, we know him to be an angel, if not from the context, which I, in my opinion makes it evident and clear, um, but the other gospel records talk about an angel or angels. And apparently there is something about him that is quite alarming because the women were alarmed and he had to tell the women not to be alarmed. And now, I've never been in the presence of an angel, at least not that I know of. However, I have a good authority, that is the biblical record, that when you are in the presence of an angel, it is quite a spectacle. And it is an experience that 99.9% .9 of the time, the angel's first response is, stop being afraid. Would you let me give you the message so we can move on in life here? Here, the Greek word alarms uh, is used only in the book of Mark, and I think that's on purpose. In this present context, we'll hear it in the next verse, and then it was used in chapter 9, verse 15, where it's Jesus' arrival on the scene to the people causes them to be overwhelmed with wonder, is how it's usually translated there. So it's this idea that has to do with emotional intensity. It's, it's this idea of awe and being overcome with fear in the super old school sense of fear, like reverence and awe. The women then quickly realize there's something going on here. They are alarmed, and this angel has their attention. And so as we examine the angel's message, there's a few things that we must note. First, it is a, his identification of the situation. This is his verification of facts. They are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. All these things we've seen, we know to be true. Check. This makes abundantly clear it was Jesus too, and the ladies were in the right place. He had been crucified, 
laid to rest there. Second, this is his explanation of events, what has occurred that the women were not privy to. He, Jesus, has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's where they laid him. Can you imagine what these women were thinking? must have been totally surreal, emotionally intense in the rapid succession, right? So you're expecting to see a tomb, the stone is in front of the door, it's sealed, it's closed, you and your peers are going to have to figure out how are we going to open this and then we're going to have to embalm this body or, excuse me, anoint this body and what, what are we even doing? And, and you arrive the stone is rolled away, you know more than that registers and you're walking in and there's an angel in front of you and you're looking around going, well, there was a body here, what on earth happened? And then the angel starts talking to you, telling you, don't be afraid, it's just fine. Okay. Then, the angel starts telling you, okay, you're right, you're in the right place, Jesus crucified, he's laid right here, look, okay, but he's gone. Yeah, he was raised from the dead. No big deal. Carry on. What? Dead people don't come back to life. I have it on pretty good authority. These women certainly did too. Third, we see, don't linger, ladies. You have a task to fulfill. Go, tell his disciples, yes, even Peter, that Jesus is going into Galilee and you will see him there just as he told you. Now, I can't imagine, again, what was going through these women's heads. Do you suppose, at that moment, it became clear to them? Do you think at that moment, they were struck with the significance that Jesus was raised from the dead? Do you think at that moment, they realized, oh, he told us this. Praise God. It's all coming to pass. No, I don't think they did. I think they actually, as Mark tells us, they were overcome by their emotions, and they fled. They ran away in fear. William Lane puts it this way in his commentary. He says, those who are confronted with God's direct intervention in the historical process do not know how to react. Divine revelation lies beyond normal human experience. There are no categories available to humans which enable them to understand and respond appropriately. You see these women respond with alarm, with fear, with bewilderment. Whatever it was about the situation exactly that caused this reaction isn't explicitly stated, but I think we can imagine as the sum total of these events that left them with <coughs> terror and bewilderment. I like this is a little more literal of the, the word terror here. A little more literal translation would be they began to have trembling. Right? So I, I think it's a little bit different than this, this fear, um, like we're afraid that a monster is going to get us. But it, it's this overwhelmed fear. This we, We're trembling. We're overcome. The emotion is too much. The information is too much, too fast. We can't process it. We're bewildered. We don't understand, and we're afraid. This is how people react to the manifestation of God throughout the book of Mark and throughout the Bible. Now, and honestly, if it were me, and I suspect the same is true, I would react in the same way. Expecting a dead body in this tomb that I could anoint, and I'm still trying to make pieces and make sense of what happened a week ago. Jesus was coming in here on the back of a donkey. It was the time we were going to set up our kingdom. We're going to kick these dirtbag Romans out of here, and we're going to establish the Israelite kingdom. We've been waiting. Our Davidic king was here. And then he was crucified. And now what? And so now as I'm trying to process and put all of these pieces back together, his mother, <coughs> this, this woman, Mary Magdalene, one of, one of, uh, one of his dearest disciples, uh, his mother's sister, can you imagine, cognitively trying to push all of this together, and you just are going to this tomb, 
to anoint his body, to see that he is at rest, to try and make sense of everything and the disappointment and the heartbreak and the confusion and the bewilderment. I, I suspect I would react in the same way. So perhaps you are aware of this next fact, and that is um, it's generally accepted that verse 8 is the end of book of Mark's gospel. Um, many of your Bibles probably have 20-ish more verses. Uh, it's almost certain that those are not original. There's a great case to be made for it. But for the second time, I will tell you that it's not this sermon. I make this point to make Mark's point. And that is, we are at this position, we see the women run away and they tell nobody. And what Mark is saying to his readers is, what are you going to do? We have an empty tomb. We have at least the implication of a risen Savior. What are you going to do? See, in the face of experiencing the risen Lord, what will you do? Will you go and tell people the good news? Will you tell them about the empty tomb and the risen Savior? Will you tell them that Jesus Christ died for their sins and rose again from the dead? Because that is the task that Mark is giving you. As his readers, Mark is saying to you, what are you going to do? And I will be the first to admit that it can be scary as anything to be standing there in that moment feeling the convincing of the Holy Spirit. Hey, Mark, you need to tell them about Jesus. Mark, you need to go minister to that person. Hey, they need you. And I'm really good at like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I gotta go. It's uh, pretty late and, uh, well, uh, You see, we are given this challenge. We are given this task. Tell the people about Jesus. Use words if you need to, which you do, but not every time. Encourage them. Love them. Be the light. Be the salt. Let them know that God wants a relationship with them through his son, Jesus Christ. You don't know how a person might respond, and you don't know if they'll be offended. You don't know if they'll stop being your friend. You don't know how it's going to impact your family dynamics. You don't know. You don't know. And the list of excuses is long. And yet, we are still given the challenge, the task, to go tell the good news. And so as we continue in the story, though, Mark leaves it out of his account. We know what happens with these women. They overcome their fear. Now, we don't know how long this paralysis of fear lasted, but we do know from the other Gospels, in a reasonably short amount of time, they go and find the Twelve, even Peter. And, they are, and aren't we glad they did? And I know that I am. It was through the faithfulness of these women that these disciples were told, and they themselves, at least two of them are recorded, went and saw the empty tomb. And indeed, then they went back to Galilee, and they met Jesus there. And so all of this leads us to today. Somebody told somebody told somebody told somebody until 2,000 years later, the church still prevails. And so I go back to my question, what will you do in response to the empty tomb? Not my question so much as Mark's. First, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that is step one. And see, I thought you were going to get all the way through the sermon without a good gospel presentation. Yeah, right. <laughs> First, bad news. You're a sinner. We are all sinners. Sin means that we did not live up to God's standard of perfection. That is, any time we lie, cheat, steal, use bad language, treat our wife how we shouldn't. Not that I do that. It's when we don't do what God says to do, or when we do do what God says not to do. That's sin. We all do it. It's the human predicament. We have more bad news. 
This sin separates us from God, and we're still, we can't do anything about it on our own. And because of this sin, we deserve death and eternal separation from God. But God, who is rich in mercy, gave us good news. He saw us in our need, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and me. Jesus took our place, and he died on the cross so that we can live. All of our sins were placed on him, and he took them to the grave in our place. So we don't have to be eternally separated from God. And more good news, all you have to do to restore that relationship is believe that that's true. Believe that Jesus died for you, that he died in your place for your sin, and he rose again from the dead. That's it. Believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you will have eternal life. The other thing that we are on the hook to do is to tell everybody about Jesus. And so this is your application. This is not just for this week, but it's for every week. It's for the rest of your time on this earth as you call yourself a Christian. We are to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins and rose again from the dead so that we may have eternal life. We may be in a restored, proper relationship with our Father in heaven. We have abundant life on this earth and into the age to come. So today, as we study the resurrection story, according to Mark, we saw a specific and distinct challenge for the women in the story and for Christians of all ages, most especially for us. We saw that these women were tasked to report their findings to the disciples, even Peter. And though they paused in fear, we know they ultimately overcame and were obedient and did so, which puts the onus on us. Christians from every age, now our age, we are challenged with the responsibility of sharing the gospel with everyone. So what will you do? Would you pray with me? Lord our God, as we are gathered here today to celebrate the risen Savior, Lord, pose and resound anew the question which the witness Mark poses for us. What will you do with the empty tomb? What will you do with this risen Savior? Father, draw us near to you. Assure us of that intimate, deep, abiding relationship that you long for with us through your Son, Jesus. And that would make us aware of your Holy Spirit as you have challenged us to tell the world about you, to tell the world about your Son, make us aware of the leading that you have placed on our hearts, that we may witness to your gospel all the time, in our actions, in our words, in our deeds, and even by full-on gospel presentations. Allow us to glorify you in this day by day. We pray all these things for your glory in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.